and welcome to Catechris Magazine. We can be found on the web at www.catechris.com. My name is Jason J. Rock Houston. Today we're speaking with um, lead singer and um, uh, the creative force behind the band, uh, Diamorte, uh, Drake Mufesta. How are you doing today, Drake? Oh, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm doing quite well. Yeah, Yourself? I'm doing great. Now, i got to let people know, um, listening to this, Drake, that... Um, you know, we were supposed to do the interview earlier, but um, but we, we rescheduled it for for right now. And you sent me a lot more information than I originally had, so I I thank you for that. And based on the information you sent me, um, I'm assuming that you were uh, a Dungeon and Dragon fan. Is it, am I correct in that? Uh, I, I would have to say that I'm, I'm just a fan of fantasy and all of its uh, oh. manifestations. But I, I found that at a very early age. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons was actually presented to me in a very organic storytelling format by a very, very, very old friend of mine. Okay. Uh, I was very young, and it really was, I, I would have to say, like the spark of inspiration that sent me on the path to uh, what you really kind of see now. And, and I, I got to tell people, like, um, you know, we, we were going to um, initially interview you uh, just about the current single and the music video for your song, um, where the light grows cold, and, and just um, looking at that video, um, I gotta tell people, um, I urge you to go on YouTube and check it out. Um, it's what I would like to call, um, and many people have, I think, um, call call it eye candy. It's a great visual, uh, it's much more than just a music video. I mean, um, it's a little over six minutes long, and to me, um, it's almost like watching kind of a mini epic movie. Um, do you think that's a fair description? I, I think it is, as well as the, that was really the intention. Um, I would have to say that Really, uh, the core foundation of what Diamorte is, is uh, we're storytellers. Okay. And we want to give complete experiences and uh, really immerse people in the world that we've created. We want people to come and play inside of it, to experience the music, uh, the live show, the story, uh, the lore, uh, everything um, kind of in between because... Uh, you know, what good is, you know, a world if uh, no one knows about it or can't appreciate it? So, you know, I, I think that really, you know, a, a, any artist is, is trying to convey something internally outward. And it's just the means by which you communicate it, you know, but there's always a message behind it, you yeah. know, and something I want to say. And what's interesting is um, I, I've heard the band and, you know, and the songs and the videos kind of described as... Um, you know, heavy or metal kind of um, symphonic, um, like metal opera type of um, type of description, and I think that's kind of a fair um, description. Now, my 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 um, question is, uh, like, when you were growing up, how much um, were you influenced by like metal metal music and that um, versus like um, actually being um, influenced by opera music? Well, it was it was a uh, it was classical music that uh, came first. I, I had a very, uh, very, I would have to say, profound event that happened um, around you know kind of my earlier years, and incidentally, prior to that, I I wasn't even into music at all. Interesting. Enough, Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I was I was strictly a manual artist. I loved to um, to paint and to do charcoal. Uh, and at the time, I was I was more dead set on conveying my uh, visions and my stories through the visual medium. Oh, wow. And so what ended up happening was I had this kind of really terrible event happen, and it put me into kind of an emotional downward spiral that I couldn't seem to convey. You know, through the visual canvas anymore. There was just something that couldn't I, I couldn't spark it i couldn't convey it wow and when walking through the hallways uh at school one day um i passed by uh the music class and uh they were doing a rendition of uh, beethoven's moonlight sonata wow and it stopped me dead in my tracks and i sat there and uh incidentally enough even like would I skipped a couple classes to go back and listen to them repeat it because that was again back before the you know the age of accessibility like we have it now, and you had to really fight for you know if you wanted to hear something on CD or you yeah, know yeah, live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so let me ask you, like, I mean, it's, I really urge people like to go check out some of the um, videos and, and read up on the band because I mean, the music to me is quite interesting. It's really nothing like. Um, I've heard before, which I think is a great um, 
compliment because I mean, th there's other symphonic, um, you know, metal bands out there, but th this really kind of stands out. On you, it's you got the ear candy, which is the music, but you got the eye candy. I mean, the video, it's the video itself. Um, all the videos you sent me to check out, you know, um, quite visual, and, and there is storytelling kind of going all along with that, and so. Um, you're one of the first musicians I've talked to that's got kind of got these different influences other than just music. You know, you're a storyteller, you're, um, you're all into visuals, and, and, and it all kind of comes together. Well, and, and first off, thank you very much for that. You know, I always just consider myself to be, you know, um, some did, you know, some dumb kid with a keyboard in a dream really i mean and just kind of like a goal of ambition to tell stories in whatever way possible um and you know the one thing that i i do emphasize more than anything is that what you're seeing is not me or any one individual it is the more it, it is the collective effort of those in and outside of the band or those who associate for a time uh we really you know try to work in a very organic structure uh, where, you know, the ideas blossom outwards and people um, who, you know, believe in it will come together and, you know, of course I do what I can to take care of everybody and, and compensate them in any way that I can, but, you know, this is something that, you know, is a culmination of everybody and um, so, you I, know, this yeah. was... I'm glad you make that point because I got to tell people, um, you know, your publicist sent me a little uh, press release on the band and there were kind of quotes like that where you, you, you kind of state state about the rest of the band and it's kind of, you know, everybody kind of getting together and doing it. And um, I give you kudos for that because a lot of times you, you talk to um, people, and, oh, no, it's, it's my band or I'm the main principal songwriter. And, and I, I think it's very important to kind of be that kind of guy and give credit to, you know, that, hey, everybody brings something to the table, you know? Well, you know, that, uh, you know, the way that I... I, I... And I would have to say I'm privileged to lead these fine people who put this faith in me. Um, really stems from personal philosophy, yeah, yeah. Um, and that personal philosophy uh, stems from my life experiences, which have been co quite a story unto themselves. Um, it's amazing how much of the story is just absolute satire of personal experiences and facets of myself, uh, but. Um, with that, you know, I, there, there was a philosophy out there that stated uh, that, you know, I believe it was the doubt that loves and nourishes all things, but does not lord it over them. And when merits are accomplished, it lays no claim to them. And I was actually privileged to learn that quote from a very wonderful semi-modern philosopher by the name of Alan Watts. Okay. And, that, and, and so that is to say that, you know, I love and nourish in whatever way I, you know, try to take care of and, and work hard for these fine people, but, you know, you do not lord it over them. And when these merits are accomplished, meaning Dio Morte, when the light grows cold ashes and sorrow, the red opera, you don't lay personal claim to them. Yeah, yeah. Because that, that is, to me, a slap in the face of those who contributed. So when things are accomplished, it's not me, it's Dio Morte. Yeah, Morte, that, that that's cool. So so it, it's it's kind of the whole the whole band coming together, as you said. And you know, um, in prepping for the interview day and watching the videos, um, you know, again when the publicist first um, sent me a press release on uh, Di Morte, um, I checked out the video. Um, I, I was reading up um, on you know the little press release, and I thought, man, this is quite different from anything I've ever seen or heard before. And it's almost kind of like um, you know back in the day when I was growing up, like they used to say Pink Floyd was. Uh, kind of a thinking man's music. This is kind of along those lines, but, um, you know, in a much more... You mentioned that uh, Pink Floyd is actually a very massive inspiration of mine. I, I, I could kind of see that. I mean, um, maybe on the surface, people watch, you know, your video, and they might not see that right away, but again, it kind of, you watch a video, you listen to the song, and it, it kind of makes you, kind of makes you, you know, really think about it, you know, what, what we're seeing on the screen and what we're watching. Um, yeah. And so, so again, um, I, I think that's just kind of um, interesting, but, um, you know, that, you know, almost 40 years after Pink Floyd, that you're, you're kind of doing your thing and you were inspired by what came before you. I, I, I want to say this more, <clears throat> excuse me, mm -hmm. towards the point of acknowledgement, I don't, I don't want this to come off like a name drop or anything like that, um, because it's, it, it's well known out there, mm -hmm. it's well known, I don't try to buy for that kind of, you know, um, but it's, it's 
a well-known fact that uh, one of my clients, one of my more prominent uh, clients, is uh, Blackie Lawless from Wasp. Uh, in the time that I've been privileged to work for him and, and with him, doing graphic design and helping him to kind of reimagine some of his earlier works, I found there were so many ideas that I had, and I brought this to his attention, uh, that when going back and doing my research on him, um, finding how many of my ideas had already been done by him. Yeah. In terms of presentation of theatrics and a story or scenery or this kind of bringing the immersion in. So. Yeah, you know, um, I, I, I grew up with, um, you know, Wasp back in the day. I mean, I was a huge fan, and um, I, I would just, um, you know... The other day, listening to a new interview he did with um, Eddie Trunk talking about his band going out you know, on their 40th anniversary tour, and um, you know, like you're saying, back in the day, Wasp. I mean, they were they had a great live show, and you know, the music was great. I mean, you um, the PMRC that was one of the main bands they went after back in the day. But if you know anything about Blackie, I mean, besides being a great entertainer, a great songwriter, he, he's a well-spoken man. He's well educated. I mean, um, and, and I think he's one of those. Um, guys that probably when people meet him they're, they're quite astonished that oh wow this guy there's much more to him than meets the eye you know um, he, he actually knows what he's talking about <laughs> well you know I'm, and the thing is I have been privileged to be surrounded by you know a lot of fil- you know fantastic people um, I mean he was obviously introducing me by you know my good friend and longtime agent you know Lloyd Fries and you know Jeff from Darkstar uh, Michael Brandfold obviously who uh, you know does a lot of marketing for me as well mm-hmm. you know these people were the ones who brought blackie to me but i think that that's a statement and a testament you know i would not have been able to get those opportunities had not other people greater than myself allowed me the opportunity to prove myself and i think that that is kind of forever the plight of any artist if you think about it yeah. is there's a lot of great art that's unsung you know oh yeah uh, i mean um and the fact that you have that kind of gratitude because um a lot of people don't. And um, again, get get back to your band. Like, um, are you guys working like towards a full length album? Um, do you kind of like a lot of people doing releasing like a song at a time, or do you see these more as? Um, like it's be- yeah, it's funny you mentioned that whole releasing a song at a time. That's starting to catch on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had been talking about doing that for a very long time. Uh, for a couple of years now, I've had a roadmap, um, which obviously. COVID threw a wrench in for everybody. Yeah. Uh, delayed it, but you know, things are coming back. Um, in which I actually sat down and I had that logical thought with myself after releasing the Red mm-hmm. Opera and the, the amount of time that I poured into it and then releasing a single at a time. I, said, I, I thought to myself, well, in this modern time, if you could simply download an entire album. Yeah. And, and it, or it's on. YouTube, you know, it makes logical sense that number one is speaking only for myself in the way that I, I would like to do it. The reasoning behind why I wanted to release a song at a time is for a couple reasons. One, I believe that obviously we do need to feed ourselves and protect our interests to the point of being able to continue to make music. I think that of that's course. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But outside of that, there is something to be said for my own personal reasons of wanting to do that, and it is because, much like Pink Floyd, especially in a time in which it's in gratification, the encouragement of everything becoming more instant, I want people to sit down, relax for a moment, and listen, meaning to digest, meaning that you can't just flip through the entire story yeah. 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 There is uh, there's a lot of love and a lot of effort, and uh, the the tracks that are put out are very well intentioned. They're very purposeful. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, cause see, I, I did grow up in the age of you know, um, you know, records and CD where you could actually um, go out and buy physical product. I mean, um, I I live in Los Angeles, and um, there's um, there's not a record store, and you know. I can't think of a single one. Um, I get all my music, uh, you know, um, through Amazon or online, you know, and so that's how it's done these days. But um, the other reason I was asking is I, I understand that you got to kind of um, get your name out there, get your brand out there, and kind of um, 
you know, give people a little taste and see and kind of um, see how the fans react to it. I mean, that makes sense too. But um, the other reason I was asking is um, back in the day when people did kind of have that model of making albums, like you'd have to have where, you know, maybe you're like Alice Cooper and who, who releases like concept albums. And so everything on the album has to kind of have a theme or um, the songs all have to kind of fit together. Whereas this modern way of doing it, it's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be that way. You can kind of, um, if you want to release kind of a heavy, aggressive track, you can do that. If you want to, um, something that's got a little softer side, you can do that as well, you know, um, right. which I think um, seems to be working for you. Well, you know, I think when we, when we went into this, looking at how we wanted to approach the music conceptually, thinking story first, thinking immersion first, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the process of even writing a song is, is almost very, very inverse from tradition. And, and I, I think what's brought about a sort of unique aspect to this is everything about this process is inverted. The orchestra and the percussions and the drums are written first before the guitars, before the vocals. Um, the story is written before the music. Okay, oh, see, see so uh, again, that's kind of, you know, another band um, is kind of uh, more of a metal band, um, Cage, um, the sing I've interviewed um, Sean Peck, the singer, several times, and um, a lot of his songs he writes kind of based um, around stories and stuff. So um, it, it's interesting that a lot of a lot of metal bands are kind of into doing that. I, you know, I going back to kind of an earlier point and bridging even over to this in terms of, of, of storytellers and what will be remembered. You know, there, there there's genuinely a reason why I believe that everybody who should give credit freely yeah. and, and openly. And it's really because of this. Um, people will often remember long uh, after, and in years after, uh, people are gone. Yeah. Only the music that was made. So that should be the most important thing that you ever do, because that's what you will be remembered for. I mean, you brought uh, up Beethoven earlier. I mean, uh, if you think about that, I mean... Right. Uh, I mean... Exactly. I'm, I can't really quote too much Beethoven, but I can tell you this much. That guy, I mean, he, he made his mark in the world for a simple fact. Hundreds of years later, after he's been long gone and dead, um, people are hundreds of years later listening to his music. So that right there tells you he made his mark, you know? And it's funny you mention that because in terms of what the goal is, like, you know, and I think like what we want out of this yeah. is to acknowledge where our inspiration came from and then pay that forward to the next generation. Um, I want to be able to inspire as I was inspired, give that gift of inspiration, uh, even to inspire only one individual to greatness. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, and it's interesting I, that you don't necessarily see these as songs. They're more kind of stories kind of come to law, life through the songs. And, um, and, and I think, um, you know, you, if you're a true storyteller, you could kind of either, um, you could be, you know, you'd be a type of storyteller, but you kind of create your own story or you're, you're writing stuff based on, as you say, your own life. And I think when you do that, um, it's much more interesting because like a lot of my favorite songwriters, even when I listen to, um, all, you know, these great classic rock tunes that you find all over classic rock. I mean, a lot of those truly great songwriters, they're, they're guys that, you know, they've taken a page out of their life and created this wonderful, you know, what's now considered a classic song um, that loved by many people. You can tell when somebody's kind of just writing a song just to kind of, um, oh, I need, I need something to go on the record as opposed to, you know, this is a song that kind of is a page out of my life. It, you know, this is something I experienced that really, you know, uh, meant something to me. And, 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 and that is honestly beautiful. Um, I, I feel like even the people within this production these people that I've been privileged to call yeah. you know even family when I look at them um, I actually I see the character uh, even sometimes more than the individual these uh, people James and, and Colin and, and Morty and um, everybody they they portray they, they, they embody that uh, that essence and what I find to be interesting about that is the characters are facets of myself uh -huh. But at the same time, as these individuals have gravitated towards these characters and have become one with them, um, it's like holding a mirror up to a candle. Now you're reflecting that light, and somebody else 
is seeing part of themselves in it and it becomes a very uh, you know again it kind of organically grows outward um and, and i think i think it's beautiful to see it manifest because you know so too do i want people to see themselves in the uh in the different mindsets of the characters because each one uh embodies a different perspective in my own life uh yeah you know, yeah yeah, Majin was the nihilist, you know, the one who understands the heat death of the universe, the logical end to all things. You know, he is the timeless one that has seen the rise and fall of every single nation. So for this story and these individual characters that people would latch onto with such fervor, to him, they're just another grain in the sand and he's going to see these same characters with different faces centuries from now. So it's like, I like to try to create this idea of are we fighting for the now or do we relinquish to the inconsequentiality of it all? And then, you, of course, you have Dorian, uh, who is like the one who is trying to lead towards freedom. You have uh, Lacroix, who is just, the, you know, one who leads with his heart and, you know, less than his head. And then Fate, who is uh, the one who embodies that hope of humanity, you know, in wanting to see humanity through the storm of these current conflicts that the, the Red Opera kind of is in. Yeah, and so um, let me ask you about like um, the current single, "Where Where the Light Grows Cold." Like when you come up with the concept for that, like uh, you get the whole band together and say, "Okay, this is kind of my concept for this song," or "This is what the story is," and then you guys kind of get in a room and you create the music together. Do you write the lyrics first, or what's the process as far as all that? Um, I mean, is it a typical situation where you get together with a band and? You guys jam a song out, or um... I, I think it's because there is no set formula for how the music's created. That I, it's hard to answer how something like that. I can only speak to how this developed, but uh, again, um, this music kind of comes from so many different ideas, you know, or it, it kind of uh, evolves in its own unique ways from song to song to song. You know, sometimes they're a lot more well structured. Sometimes there's they're improvised. Sometimes it's a one shot. Sometimes it needs to be restructured five or six times. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, so even when you go about like kind of, I guess, um, talk about sharing the credit or, you know, even songwriting credit, I mean, um, does everybody kind of just share in the songwriting um, credit and all that? Or how does that work? Um, you know, so that, that, you know, because it's such a large production, it gets very difficult sometimes yeah, like, yeah. At, at the very end to take stock of exactly what everybody did uh, a very open form discussion um I'm, I'm, of course everything with glass door and transparency you know, really from song to song depending on who maybe came up with the idea first but who finished it who contributed the most at least um will kind of just vary depending on um for the most part a couple of key staples at least i could say is that I do write the story. Okay. So like, so like I said, so if we were going kind to of start with what the average would be, just to kind of get something tangible for you. Yeah. Uh, I generally will present the story. Um, I will present the concepts, uh, piano lines, ideas, and I will structure it in such a way as I will actually pre-meditate how I want the song to go. So I will sit down and I will kind of do a graph and in that graph will show the intensity. It'll have key markers for how I want the audience to feel. Wow. Um, I'll set up mood tracks. I'm very, uh, I guess you would say, like, very compensating in how I imagine the song to flow. And I often equate it to roller coasters, yeah. which, um, you know, like, if you actually listen back to um, something like where the light goes, but for instance, uh, just to give you a little behind the scenes, the right process behind that is I said, all right, in thinking of terms of a roller coaster, you're going to have that build up, that tension, that rise. Then you get to the very top. Yeah. And then you get yeah, yeah, yeah. that slight pause. Yeah. Now you, yeah. And then you're off to the races and you're down and you're through the loops and you're through the so now, if you go back and listen to Michael's Cold, you start to see that build up, build up, build up, silence, and then boom, into the song. So, you know, in conducting the kinds of fluidities and emotions, I'm also receiving input from the band and feedback yeah, on yeah. 
purpose. So that's where the organic process comes in. Again, part of the reason I'm asking that is because just talking to you and listening to the uh, music, um, I can tell there's many layers to, to what you do. And like, it's not a typical situation of, of you know, somebody coming in with the guitar and strumming their guitar and you coming up with the lyrics. There's a lot different layers to, to what you do. And I think that's uh, when people are um, going to be checking this stuff out, they're going to kind of see what I'm talking about. And the other thing is, I think, if you were to go the modern way of, um, I think, you know, maybe when you get enough songs, maybe nine or ten songs, you know, maybe then you could uh, release a, a, a CD or something like that. But um, I think it's cool the way you're doing it because, again, a lot of these songs are, are, you know, they're not typical songs. They're they're a little um, longer, you know, over six minutes long. But, but again... And listening to the track, I, I wasn't getting bored. I wasn't thinking, oh, boy, boy, this track is going on and on. I mean, I was I was still kind of being entertained, if you know what I mean. Well, and thank you for that, and I greatly appreciate it. Um, it it's really, I mean, that is actually what we set out to achieve. And uh, I think that, in essence, what you're describing right there is also something of a dissatisfaction that I had when I would listen to a, a given song and feel like there was a repetition in it that I was ready to move on and I was ready for something new yeah yeah but you don't want it where it's um where it's so bombastic assaulting you with change after change it's whipping you about you know um you want a nice step low from to the highs to the lows and again looking at it in, in a structure even like the rise of the waves you yeah, know yeah yeah which is in all the ways, you know, so you want your highs, your lows, you don't want those jagged, spiky dissonances, you know, and um, I think just like in telling a successful story, you want to have a smooth position from beginning to middle. Yeah, yeah, and you know, um, what's interesting is I think a lot of people fail to realize, um, even, a, even a great guitar player, say like um, Richie Blackmore from um, Deep Purple, now there's a guy that was influenced by, like you're saying, People may not even realize classical music. That's where he got his start, and then he kind of got did his Deep Purple thing for many years, and then now the music he's making is kind of um, it sounds almost kind of folky. It's a bit, way different than what he did in um, Rainbow or Deep Purple. But uh, I mean, everybody's got you know different influences. So again, you got to allow yourself to kind of go there and kind of understand that people are influenced by all kinds of things. <laughs> I think it's interesting to think about the fact that. Um when, when, when recalling interviews with uh, black metal artists, I heard more than a few times that they got their influences from their parents who were into the blues. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Dark oppressiveness. So then the question becomes, uh, was I influenced by black metal or gear or was I influenced by the blues? What came before it? And the answer is yes. And before that, and before that, and before that, and before that. Yeah, because I was just getting ready to ask you that, you know, you're, you're from Chicago, and I know um, that Chicago, for years, um, I mean, they had a huge blues scene. I don't know what it's like there now, but, um, you know, where do you think um, De Morde fits in, you know, the Chicago music scene? Um, I, I don't think it does, if I'm going to be honest, and I, I, I need, you know, yeah, I, yeah. Think that, I, I don't think that that is an unfair assessment. Um, we, we had done a couple of shows. Now, that's not to say that we don't have people that appreciate us here. Oh, no, no. no you know? Definitely not, uh, but it's just kind of interesting that, um, like I said, for example, I know that's Chicago. That's what they're known for, blues. And it's kind of, and I've talked to other people, and yeah, they have other kinds of music, but, um, you know, that's the thing when you hear Chicago, people ultimately go to, you know, oh, Chicago, um, you know, blues, R&B. <laughs> well, and in, in even in terms of... Uh you know, like what we're doing, it's it's simply not a uh, an appropriate fit for what the major interest is here, and that's okay. Yeah, that's I was just going to say, you know, that 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 makes it kind of all right though, because that, okay. that tells you there's a place, you know, there, or more, maybe better word is there's a need for it, you know. Well, obviously, we will always go where the demand is. Yeah, it's yeah. Not like we're going to actively shut out anywhere. Um, if the demand is there, of course, we'll be happy uh, to come and entertain. So you know, yeah, let's talk push. about, you said you've done a few live shows, so what were those like? And, um, you know, because again, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's not a typical um, a metal show. <laughs> well, you know, being the fact that I also 
fund, um, you know, practically the, the whole thing. Uh, it, it makes raising, you know, capital, but also li- making it logistically possible uh, to do shows. So what we would do is we would just do, like, literally, like, straight one-offs. Um, and I mean, like, once every year or two years. Because at the time, especially for the last seven years, is how long it took me, I believe, approximately five to seven years to raise the capital and also to produce the Red Opera album. Wow. And I solely bled everything for the last uh, near decade into that. And then, of course, after that came this. So if you figure that uh, 12 to 13 years with, you know, sporadic one-off this is, shows. This really is that, kind of your life's work then, I mean. Um, and so, like, let, let's just go back to the last show you did. I mean... Um, how many, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a performance, but like how many uh, of these songs or these stories were kind of, or what did you just kind of... Um... It, was, it, was the, it was the entire Red Opera set front to back, uh, theatrically done with the full thing, the props, the, um, all the actors, full theatrics, lighting, everything. You know? and, and I'm assuming you, you, you probably at least, um, for your own archive, full um, videotaped it or something, or at least taped the show, so you have... A little bit, but it's it's irrelevant. Yeah, it's, yeah. But I mean, yeah. again, it must kind of feel like your life's work. I mean, when when you you know go that far in between you know both shows. I mean, um, the Red Opera. Now let, let's talk a little bit. But you said that's like the, um, the the whole collection of songs. So um, is there like a physical thing people could go out if they wanted to get their hands on that? Uh, dot com. Okay, uh, great, great. And then I was it, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. For interrupting, go ahead. Oh no, I was gonna say everything is there. Okay, and then um, I was also reading you sent me something about um, you done like a, a Kickstarter um, campaign for that. So uh, I mean, obviously it got made, so um, you you raised the funds. But talk a little bit about what that process was like for you. Oh, that that my friend is a story. So uh, going back to the completion of Ashes and Sorrow, Paul Allender and myself were in Rick Hines's uh, kitchen. Rick Hines is long time, lifelong friend of mine. Um, I've known him forever, and I have been privileged to see him himself rise through the upper echelons of the gaming and uh, writing world. He is a successful author, and mm-hmm. um, um, who does fun, uh, fantasy novels. His uh, line, uh, The Seventh Age Dawn, um, which you should definitely check out. Uh, absolute sarcastic, end of the world fantasy. Fantastic. Wow. So what so what ended up happening was we had this um, conversation uh, while we were sitting uh, just after filming uh, and rapping on Ashes and Sorrow, and we and we got to thinking about how many friends we knew and other famous metalheads yeah. that we were that were either openly or secretly gamers. Yeah, yeah. And, and then we started to regale our own late night, you know, adventures and all this stuff, and we said. And it was uh, actually Rick who proposed writing the Red Opera and then bringing it to go get produced. And lo and behold, uh, for the for the two years, uh, and actually, I think this was a lot of like what we did during COVID. Yeah, uh, we when the light grows cold, we worked on uh, the Red Opera RPP. We worked on music, uh, which will get released, um, as I said, at throughout the the next uh, year or so. Oh, uh, that's gosh, cool. say, and um, so he worked with all these fantastic artists and uh, they produced it this beautiful book Uh, but then we went one step further we got miniatures uh, made we got coffee made because uh, we were all coffee holics and uh, you you can't have a late night session without coffee so you know it's like and all these so essentially all these things uh, our own signature dice our own just everything uh, dice tower map um See, cool, you know, you're, you're kind of along uh, lines, of, you know, my next question is going to be like, um, you know, besides the music and, and doing this live every once in a great while, um, you know, with the storytelling, you know, you obviously could get into like um, putting out books, you know, based on the stories and stuff like that. Um, you and, and the gaming too, I could see where you could kind of uh, take it to that level. Have you given any thought to that? 
yeah, actually I can, uh, to both accounts. Uh So Rick uh, and I, when the time is right, which is unknown at this point. Yeah, yeah, it's a work in progress, yeah. (laughs) We we will sit down and we will write out the story as it was intended. The interesting thing, which I had not mentioned, is that the, the actual story of the Red Opera album was based on a story that I never published back in 2008. Yeah. And sat on for four years before deciding to convert that 400 pages into an album. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think yeah. what, what's interesting about what you and your band are doing, um, you know, your, your the guys in the, that are involved in this, is um, it's an interesting way to kind of present something different. I mean, um, I mean, you got you to be honest that music is a real universal thing. It has the power to bring people together. You know, so uh-huh. people... People initially are just checking out the music, but then they find out, wait a minute, there, there's different layers to this. There's actually, a, you know, the, the music's based on a story, but different songs are different kind of um, stories. There's other things to kind of um, think about here besides just, you know, the, the, the music. And, and I think, you know, the cool way that you're going about it is like you're saying, oh, there'll be other songs down the line. And doing it kind of that way, I mean, you, you, you're, you don't have the politics of your typical record company where... Okay, well, you know, you got six more months to get the record done, and then we're going to release it, and you're going to go have to go out on tour. Um, I kind of dig the modern way that um, you're doing it because you're like, oh, check, this is what we're doing now, but you know, check back here in three months, and we'll have something else for you, or, or whenever the case may be, and um, it, it kind of leave people wanting, wanting more, you know. Well, uh, you know, we we want to be the record label, and that's really what we are. We are the we are our own record label. I mean, we do work with uh, Dark Star Records, who yeah, does the yeah. but we essentially write our own ticket. Uh, we do things on our own terms because that's the only way it's ever going to be honest. And, and, and who's going to promote your stuff better than you? You know, um, yeah. but but I, I will say, Dark Star Records. I mean. Their uh, record company just kind of, uh, but I'm just kind of finding out about, and I mean, um, they they got a, l- a lot of great bands and a lot of great um, releases, um, and I think um, so. They're 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 doing a great job at kind of promoting um, the bands they're working with. Uh, Jeff, the the the, the owner or president, um, he met me when I was 17. Wow. And um, he met me while I was doing an open mic night. And in black leather pants, uh, black eye shadow, long black hair, and a trench coat. Wow. And this, and this madman somehow thought that there was something unique about me that he decided to take a, just an absolute chance. And he has been like a mentor and uh, even, dare I say, a father figure uh, to myself. Uh, just uh, like Lloyd, uh, these two people have like mentored me uh, greatly over the years, and uh, you know I can attribute a lot of my business sense to their philosophy because they, in um, what their agreement is and how what they stand for is, they don't hold any rights to my to my um, stuff. That's cool. That's cool. I mean, um, again, they're they're great at what they do because I, I think one of their most recent releases was um, the new Tony Martin solo album. Um, he's a guy that was in Black Sabbath in the eighties and nineties, and um, uh-huh. The album's just like people are buying it, and uh, I mean, um, it's probably one of the best-selling things Tony Martin's um, done, and getting a lot of attention. So, I mean, um, that shows you the kind of label they are, you know? Absolutely, um, and it's it's been a privilege uh, because they they let me just do do me. They, they they let me do my thing, and and I um, and I appreciate that. Uh, they they know that I'm playing the long game, and that. And what I'm trying to do is to create a business out of this in which this is a, a viable construct that would allow for the musicians to have a dignified income as a musician. And they, seem to be, yeah, and they seem to be kind of labeled that kind of really um, believes in the in their artists and allow, allows you to kind of do it your um, way. So there is so, a few labels that are still out there. I mean, um, typically, you know, if, if your album doesn't sell, you know... A, ton of copies when it first comes out um you, you know you get dropped and you know it's not like um where you get to really build the band up so it's very important to have, have that kind of support behind you yeah i was uh, i was talking uh, actually with a good friend of mine mike um the other day and i i was explaining this philosophy that i had as i grow you know this and of course the red opera productions which is my business that kind of all this diamante stuff sits under um 
and I said that eventually, you know, with my graphic design and editing and skills and all that stuff, that I want to, you know, grow this and kind of be one of those in, in 10, 20 years, be those, you know, forces for good that, you know, um, whether I would be able to help give accessibility to musicians or mentorships or consulting, um, I think that there's a self-perpetuated um, guardedness in the music industry right now because of the fact that people are afraid to be able to give their time or their energy because they don't know if they're going to get screwed over. And, you know, I want to do what I can, and at least in my short years, to yeah. kind of curb, you know, by leading by example, starting with this, Dio Morte. Yeah, and, and you, know, um, you know, you mentioned your friend Blackie Lawless. Like I said, I'm, I'm pretty excited that he's getting ready to go out on tour again um, in the U.S. for the first time in several years. And, um, you know, he, he's a guy that, um, I don't know if you ever got a chance to hear of a... Um, Crimson Idol album he did, but that was very different from all the other Wasp albums, and, and yet um, he, it was one of his probably most critically acclaimed albums, if you can believe that. Yeah, we, we, you know, we had a lot of discussions, you know, while, um, while we were developing this, and, you know, I was very privileged to get just in, in, a, in a very similar way this kind of insider insight into... Um, what somebody feels when they put something out, you know, yeah. because I, I feel like if, if you are going to reflect somebody's artistry, you have to kind of know what the source of it was. Of course, know? of course, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but that, you know, that, that's, um, if you know anything about that album, The Crimson Idol, is kind of a, a concept album, too, and um, it's some of um, his most prolific stuff, and people really kind of, for the first time, you know, sat down and listened to... Um, what he was writing about, and and people were kind of surprised and taken back. But um, I think you're on to something here, and and um, I, I know you, um, I know it's getting late where you are, so we'll get ready to wrap it up. But um, I, I got to end on this. Uh, talk a little bit about how you came up with the name Diamorte, because again, that's that's very kind of different. It's unique, and it's kind of like yeah, what what is that? What is Diamorte? You know. So Diamorte is an amalgamation of a few words that I thought at the time best reflected not only myself, but I wanted what I wanted to reflect in the production. Uh -huh. uh, or, uh, amore, love, morte, uh, death, wow. dia, and dia, morte, wow. pass through, death. Uh -huh. uh, when, when you put that actually all together, if you, you know, separate dia and morte, the passing, um, it's a reflection of the music, and again, bringing again full cycles. Uh, the music is a reflection of life experiences, especially you know my many years as a mortician, which we really didn't even get a chance of going oh, to. Oh wow! Too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but the concepts and the philosophies developed through that life, um, and a lot of personal loss really has been the driving force because I, I really do think that art is achieved or i should even say greatness is achieved through suffering and i think if you suffer towards something the greater it becomes so i can only say that you now at the end of this if we are going to wrap this up that i am you know i'm truly privileged for those who are able to listen to this i, I genuinely hope that something reflects in them that i felt when writing this and when other people came in and what they contributed and um you know yeah because because I, I will i will tell you um <laughs> I would tell you here that um, the, the interesting thing, um, Drake, is um, you know um, I, I'm really I really enjoy these interviews I do with different people, and I, I do for a lot of reasons. I mean, first of all, I'm I'm a fan of music. I typically am a guy that listens to hard rock and metal, and so when um, your publicist Michael sent me you know the little press release on the band, I read up on it, I check out the video, and checking out the video, I love what I heard musically. Visually, I thought again, I uh, um, like Blackie Wallace says eye candy. I mean. Um, Visually, it is a killer, unique thing, and I'm thinking, you know, this isn't my initial response. I'm thinking this is like nothing I've seen or heard before. I mean, like you said, you got your influences, I'm sure, but it, it I'm like, man, I can't even tell who this guy was influenced, you know, because this is so so different and so unique. So again, I think for that reason alone, people are gonna love checking out your stuff, and I and I, I believe everybody has a story to tell, and I was kind of dead on because. You have a unique, very different kind of story, and I think when people hear back the interview, they're, they're going to be digging everything you've had to say. I I hope. 
yeah. in my short years that I have enough time to tell the rest of the stories that have been uh, going in my head. And, um, well, even to your listeners, you know, no art, no matter how great it is, um, it's worth anything if there's not eyes to see it or ears to hear it. So to you, and especially to your listener, uh, you really gratitude and my thanks, and I uh, appreciate time. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, this, this is really kind of... Um it's bringing like different art forms together. I mean, like typically you go see a movie, it's kind of bringing the art and you know, the, the, the art, the sound, the visuals, um, you know, the script, everything comes together. Um, you know, and so it's, it's, it's all that magic and, and you were able to do it. I mean, and Pink Floyd, even back in the day, besides their music, they were besides being considered like thinking man's music, they were considered kind of art. I mean, I, I seen here in Los Angeles, um, they had a, at the Grammy Museum recently um, a Pink Floyd ex, um, like exposition on, on all all different art, all their different art and stuff through the years. It's just it's amazing, you know, when you stop and think, what is art? I I think honestly, yeah, art is anything that makes you feel. Yeah, and then I guess my final question for the day is: um, Are you at all um, a, a fan of like horror movies or anything like that? Uh, you know, absolutely. Um, uh, I've been introduced to a wide variety, especially around the world, and uh, I love, I love the concept of horror. I love the concept of being faced with mortality. Yeah, cause, cause I, um, I, I did a thing recently on like I, I could not believe like going back to 1931, the original, um, you know, Dracula and Frankenstein. Nine, those 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 classic uh, horror flicks came out like 90 years ago. Yeah, and to that point, you know, do you remember all the stagehands and everybody in the credits? Oh, oh yeah, I mean, um, I even did a thing recently on, um, I don't know if you've seen the comedy, kind of comedy horror flick, um, Young Frankenstein was a, um, yeah. but again, uh, if you check that out, um, they made it in black and white, and the credits, what was interesting in that movie, uh, like a lot of those classic horror flicks, the credits come at the beginning of a movie, not at the end. And, and, and what's beautiful about that? is that that in of itself um, puts on display exactly what I talked about. Those people all achieved one singular vision, you know. Yeah, and, and, we'll, and, yeah. and we'll, end on, we'll end on this because, you know, another thing in, in doing my research on those horror movies is, um, for example, um, there's a scene in um, the original Frankenstein movie from 1931 where, they, where uh, this guy says, um, I know what it now feels like to be God. And back in the day, that was considered um, blasphemy. And because of that line in Frank Frankenstein, they came up with all these standards of things. Like, you could not even say, um, you know, the, the words like God or Jesus back in the day. They had all these things that you, um, you know, that you could or couldn't say or you couldn't even insinuate. And it's funny that you go back to when, like, movies were being, first being made like that. You know, film industry starts starting to kind of censor himself. It's just, it's just amazing. <laughs> I think it's really interesting as we've gotten into modern day technology and if you think of everything from nanobytes to AI to uh, how people can hack something else from around the world, that in of itself is godlike in nature. And I think that as we've evolved as a species, I hope we have, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, in that sense. But I think it, it, it bears, you know, questioning um, redefining in some aspects. Okay, we knew God as such a thing at this one intangible time. Yeah, it, we identify God by our own human experiences. Now we ourselves are doing everything from creating music on digital laptops um, to uh, breaking into digital access and giving uh, another person a million dollars. Yeah, yeah, and, ch and changing the absolute course. Or I shouldn't even say changing, setting or resetting the course of somebody else's entire livelihood. Is that not godlike in power? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would just in on this. I, I think um, everybody's got the right to believe in whatever the heck they want to believe in, and, and what you believe in or I believe in is not important. It's um, it's more about having the right to believe in. You know. Absolutely, and uh, and that is you know representative of. I think like what we, you know, we ourselves are trying to do it. What we're trying to achieve is not easy, but we kind of sit there and say to ourselves, well, 
we're not going to make music. Not every song is going to absolutely and definitively please every single one of the individuals consistently. However, it will be honest. It will be. Uh, we will strive to make it of quality. It may take time, but we will do what we can to make it worth it. And if at the very least, um, if we stick to our guns, you will know that the piece of music that we put out was not put out for any other reason than we specifically wanted to tell it in this particular way, and we hope people enjoy it. And I don't, I don't think that you could get any more honest than that. Yeah, and, and well, not, not everybody is going to love it. Um, I will say the people that do, you will, you, you will no doubt be entertaining quite quite a few people with your music, and... Um, you know, Drake. Let's let's keep in touch because I, I think um, I, I had a lot of fun doing the interview day, and I, I it's it's a uh, a lot of interviews I've done. It, it's it's really quite different, but that's a good thing. I mean, um, I, uh, it really kind of made me think today. All the stuff you're saying, and and, um, and and I think there's so much more we could talk about, but um, we'll, we'll save that for another day. And um, if you could hold on for just a minute, I, I'd appreciate it. Hey, 